Rachel Donaldson. Rachel Donaldson is a cultural historian of the U.S. during the 20th century. Her work has appeared in the Journal of Popular Culture, the Encyclopedia of the Cultural Wars, and is forthcoming in the History of Education Quarterly. She's the co-author of Roots of the Revival, American and British Folk Music in the 1950s with Ronald D. Cohen. Currently, she's working with the National Historical Landmarks Program of the National Park Service and teaches in the Prison Scholars Program at the Jessup Correctional Institution. Please welcome Rachel Donaldson. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so this book actually comes from my PhD dissertation. Uh, it has been significantly revised. Um, and, and, uh, in it, I try to do two main things. I study the folk music revival in its entirety, from the 1930s to the 70s. And I use it to, for one, examine the long history of multiculturalism. Uh, historians have typically treated the uh, origins of multiculturalism, the educational theory that uh, children should take pride in their ethnic and racial heritages, and having people from these uh, ethnic and racial her uh, uh, groups speak for themselves. That's traditionally been uh, regarded as coming out of the uh, identity politics of the 1960s. Um, and the kind of ethnic and racial pride movements that follow. But actually, a lot of the ideas of multiculturalism have a much longer history and really extend back to ideas of cultural pluralism from World War I. So that's one aim of this. The second aim is to show connections between two major periods of left-wing activity in the United States. The old left of the 1930s and 40s and the new left of the 1960s. Now, traditionally, again, these two periods have been treated as separate. That the old left consisted of a bunch of Stalinists who were crushed by the era of by McCarthyism and the Second Red Scare. And rising like a phoenix from the ashes of activism comes the new left of the 1960s. Well, I'm part of a group of historians that argue that this is not necessarily the case. That actually there are a lot of continuities between the old left and the new left. There are a lot of ideological continuities and there are literal continuities with people like Pete Seeger, another activist who were popular in the 1930s and continued on through the 1960s. So I really make these arguments by studying programs and people involved in the revival. So what I'm going to do for this reading is begin with the introduction of my book that kind of lays out the parameters uh, of, of the project as a whole, and then get into one particular program. And the program was a series of educational albums that the record producer, Moses Ash, released in the early 1960s. How many of you have seen Inside Lewin Davis? Okay, <laughs> Moses Ash is depicted as the uh, record producer for Lewin Davis. That is pretty spot on for <laughs> my research on how uh, Moses Ash treated his uh, musicians. So with that, I'm going to begin at the beginning. In 1965, the musician Pete Seeger published an article in which he explained his interest in folk music. Seeger was 16 when he first attended the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival in Asheville, North Carolina in 1935. As a child of two musicians, Seeger was no stranger to different genres of music. Yet at the festival, he wrote, uh, introduced him to something entirely new. It was then that Seeger fell in love with what would become his musical trademark the five-string banjo. The banjo, however, was not all that drew Seeger's attention. He became enamored with all facets of the music he heard that day. The rhythms, melodies, and most of all, the song lyrics. Seeger explained, quote, compared to the trivialities of most popular songs, the words of these songs had all the meat of human life in them. They sang of heroes, outlaws, murderers, fools. Above all, they seemed to be frank, straightforward, honest. Folk songs, Seeger learned, told a great deal about the people who performed them. His subsequent experiences with folk music over the next 30 years led him to conclude that these songs could help Americans, quote, learn about ourselves and learn about each other. As a music of the people, folk music provided a way to understand, quote, where we come from, the trials and tribulations of those who came before us, the good times and the bad, end quote. Seeger argued that music also enabled Americans to understand their fellow citizens, the ones with whom they would most likely never interact, by asking, quote, how many white people have rediscovered their own humanity through the singing of American Negro songs? 
How many town dwellers have learned a bit about the rougher outdoor life from songs created by men with calloused hands? In short, folk music introduced Americans of many walks of life to each other, thus rendering the imagined national community more tangible. Seeger published this piece shortly after folk music peaked in popular culture. During the early 1960s, the years between the end of the 1950s rock and roll rebellion and before the British invasion, folk music had become a mainstream musical fad, commonly referred to as the folk revival. The actual revival, however, was much more expansive than merely the boom of folk music in popular culture. It was, in fact, a movement that began in the early 1930s, which brought public folklorists, cultural preservationists, scholars, musicians, political activists, and musical entrepreneurs together in the effort to protect, preserve, and promote folk music. Um, as with any movement, the revivalists encumbered in various and sometimes conflicting views and aims. Despite these differences, they shared the core belief that, because it came from the American people and thus depicted American experiences, folk music constituted a critical component of the nation's cultural heritage. The revivalists knew that music was not dead, what they sought to revive was Americans' knowledge and interest in their living musical heritage, a heritage that revealed the essence of their national identity. In 1960, Moses Ash began releasing albums specifically tailored for junior high and high school history and social studies classes. Unlike his earlier educational series, he released his first educational series in the mid-1950s, uh, which had focused on spoken word rather than music, these albums of American history alternated song tracks with narrated documents. The first album, American History and Ballad and Song, prepared by Albert Baruch and Theodore O. Crone, contains songs selected for their maximum effective use in 7th, 8th, and 9th grade sections. Each song is followed by thought questions, and every section concludes with homework assignments. Now, if any of you are teachers, all these records are still available through Folk Voice Records, <laughs> so, along with the curriculum that I discuss here. But the album celebrates civic ideals such as political democracy and emphasize the contributions that minority groups, groups made to national development. For example, a homework question that follows the song Shamrock, describing the plight of Irish immigrants, states, quote, what contributions have different religious, ethnic, and national groups made to America? Can you list several specific examples? The development of democracy section opens with the song Free Elections, an 18th century song on suffrage, which explains the importance of the vote. A homework question following this piece is even more relevant to both historical and contemporary problems. Quote, since the vote is so precious, some people would like to prevent federal fellow Americans from using it. Can you give examples of this? Now, if the message behind this question was too subtle, students were also instructed, quote, in a summary paragraph, explain why this is dangerous for everyone. <laughs> Subsequent sections include the early republic, 19th century immigration, the civil war, industrialization, and the American farmer. The industrialization section largely focuses on the poor working conditions early industrial workers suffer, as well as the unionization drives they embrace to uphold their rights. Songs such as My Children Are Seven in Number teach about the 1933 coal strikes in Davidson and Wilder, Tennessee. And students are asked to list the miners' grievances as well as the advantages that the mine owners had and, quote, exploited over the workers. The section continues with songs from textile mill strikes, such as Mill Mother's Lament by Ellen Mae Wiggins, a union organizer who was killed during a textile strike in, da in Gastonia, North Carolina in 1929, and the death of Pilot Perry Sims, about another union organizer, a communist organizer, who was killed by company guards during a coal strike in Harlan County, Kentucky in 1932. Students are again asked to recognize the grievances that the workers had and determine what the government could have done to help them. The thought question directs students to explain why workers would want to unionize. And one of the homework assignments asks students to imagine being a unionizer uh, for mill workers and to write a speech that would convince them to organize. After this, the American Farmers section begins with the 19th century populist movement and then explores injustices of the sharecropping and tenant farming systems and concludes with the Dust Bowl through the songs Raggedy, Seven Cent Cotton, and Forty Cent Meat, 
and Dust Storm Disaster. The collection ends with the section The World of Man, which features Japanese Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Polish, Hungarian, and South African songs. It also includes the song It's the Same All Over, which summarizes the section's theme of quote, presenting the case that all men are basically alike in their hopes, fears, and dreams. The second volume of the American History and Ballad and Song series was geared for high school social studies classes, specifically for students at the sophomore through senior levels. Now, taking a thematic more than a chronological approach, it explores variations of democracy, with sections dedicated to cultural, political, economic, and international democracy. The first section on cultural democracy delves into investigating the components of American national identity. Now again, attention is paid to the influence of immigrant cultures. Students are asked to examine what factors pulled different uh, immigrants to the United States, where various groups settled, what hardships they faced, and how these hardships have been eased through legislation. The discussion of immigration soon turns to investigation of American xenophobia through Woody Guthrie's Two Good Men about the trial of Nicolo Sacca and Bartolomeo Vanzetti and Sherman Wu. Sherman Wu is a more contemporary song about a student who was denied entry into a fraternity at Northwestern because he was Chinese. Uh, and it's set to the tune Streets of Laredo. Uh, Closing the section on cultural democracy is a popular contemporary Puerto Rican song and a documentary clip of Puerto Rican uh, migrants arriving at Isla Well Kennedy Airport in New York. The entire emphasis of the section is on cultural diversity, with, uh, um, and students are asked to examine how the United States has dealt with the plurality of ethnic cultures. Although the songs chosen for the section highlight the importance of cultural diversity, students are asked to ponder the costs and benefits of living in a heterogeneous society. Now the economic section continues to investigate American history from the people's perspective. Illustrating laissez-faire capitalism and the public versus private debate are such songs as Les Price's Banks of Marble, with such lyrics as, then we'd own those banks of marble and we'd share those vaults of silver that we all have sweated for. Now, I really wanted to include much many more lyrics from this song, but copyright issues, I could not. Uh, but yes, it's all about taking taking back the wealth. <laughs> um, the theme of the downtrodden, challenging conditions of uh, inequality continues throughout the next session, political democracy. It opens by claiming that universal suffrage is essential to democratic government, but that throughout American history, several groups, such as women, have been excluded from voting. Students are asked to list other groups who did not have the right to vote, and to identify any groups who were still denied that right. Uh, the third part of the section features a speech by Martin Luther King Jr. calling for the right to vote for African Americans in the South. Again, making the connection between historical circumstances and contemporary conditions. The section continues with the hardships that migrant workers have endured and closes with the McCarthy Committee's abuse of Americans' constitutional rights during the 1950s. Now, these albums continue in the same vein as Ash's educational albums of the prior decade, articulating a version of U.S. history reminiscent of progressive history, which highlighted conflicts between social and economic groups, and that had fallen out of favor after the rise of consensus historians in the 1950s. Now, by presenting an interpretation of the nation's past that championed the working class, internationalism, and civil rights, they also presented a left-wing view of American history and identity reminiscent of the Popular Front. And the Popular Front was really the cultural program of the, of the old left, what other historians like Michael Denning have referred to as, as the cultural front. Um, even though it was uh, uh, imparting historical interpretation that was academically and politically out of step with mainstream trends, Folkways Records received many letters commending it specifically for its educational endeavors. In 1960, George U. Dawson, an assistant professor of social studies at NYU, wrote to Ash about an article that he wrote on the use of folk music as a teaching tool. In the letter, he compliments Folk Boys for its albums and notes how successful they have been in his American history classes. Even students wrote to express their appreciation. In a letter to Marion Disler, and technically Marion Disler was the president of Folk Boys, a student named Dan Harris states, quote, I respect Folk Boys as an instrument for the promotion of culture and education. Furthermore, he notes the political persuasion of folk ways, or at least those who were fans of the company, uh, by commenting that he was introduced to the company's records 
when his history teacher, a quote, bit of a leftist, played some albums of social protest music. I was, quote, I was tremendously impressed. One doesn't have to have any particular political leanings to love these records. Even the writers at the Little Sandy Review, a magazine of, so a magazine of um, that students at uh, and so wrote about folk music, uh, the magazine that often lambasted the revivalists who used folk music for political purposes, commended Ash's educational efforts. Um, Edmund Gilbertson praised the album American History and Ballad and Song, Volume 1, by writing, quote, I absolutely turn green with envy of today's enlightened junior high school uh, social studies classes when I find that they can study the problems of the American farmer by listening to Woody Guthrie sing Dust Storm Disaster, learn about colonial hardship with Peggy Seeger's When I Was Single, study the causes of industrial fair play legislation by hearing Pete Seeger sing The Blind Fiddler and so on. Ah, progress. <laughs> on these recordings, Ash did sometimes fall into the trap of romanticizing the American folk as well as American history. But he did so to promote a more just, inclusive, and egalitarian national community. Ash's respect for civil rights and his conception of American identity as rooted in cultural pluralism and social justice drove his recording ventures, especially in the realm of education.